tonight on the new reality. An entire city going under quarantine. It was scary, to be honest with you. I've never seen the city um, like that. But one year later, <laughs> Wuhan is roaring back to life, back to school and work. Everybody buys into the idea of social distancing, masking, and so they were able to eliminate the, the virus in a very uh, short period of time. I think just the way they did it is pretty amazing. How does a museum fulfill its mandate with no visitors? Our revenues are really based off of people coming through these doors. It was just devastating. Having gone through this experience, it's opened our minds to different methods of telling a story. Hello and welcome to The New Reality. I'm Donna Friesen. A year ago, the world was watching a catastrophe unfold in Wuhan, China. Infections and deaths from COVID-19 were soaring. Millions of people were under strict lockdown and cases were beginning to appear in countries around the world. Canada sent a plane to rescue Canadians who were stranded in the place where this pandemic started. Tonight, Jeff Semple takes us back to Wuhan to see how life has changed. <laughs> Lately, Bin Zhang has been feeling homesick. The married father of two grew up in China and moved here to Calgary when he was 18. He says people occasionally ask where he's from, but until last year, few had ever heard of his hometown of Wuhan. I certainly didn't want uh, my hometown's name to be well known in this way. In January 2020, Zhang planned to travel to Wuhan to visit his parents. His wife and children were already there after arriving a few weeks earlier for Chinese New Year. Zhang had heard reports of a strange new virus, but wasn't too concerned until he was about to board his flight to Beijing and a headline splashed across the screens. On this Wednesday night, an entire city going under quarantine. It was such a surreal experience, right? Like nobody has imagined things like this. Just the thought of me being separated from my family, from my kids was really scary. Right, so people are trying to get out of Wuhan. You're trying to get into Wuhan. That's right. How difficult was that? So once I landed in Beijing, I went to the front desk and I said, hey, um, I have a flight schedule to go into Wuhan. And then they basically say, what? And I said, I'm flying to Wuhan. And they said, no, you're not. So Zhang caught a flight to a city nearby and drove the rest of the way, eventually reuniting with his family and arriving to find his hometown a ghost town. It was scary, to be honest with you. I've never seen the city um, like that. The city of 11 million was locked down, cut off from the world for 76 days. Some trapped inside witnessed terrifying scenes of panic and death. Zhang Han Nung's 39-year-old son died from COVID-19 after she says he was forced to wait weeks to receive treatment with the hospitals overwhelmed. <laughs> Every day I suffer from imagining the pain he went through, she says, how he struggled and cried all alone. A couple of weeks into Wuhan's lockdown, the Canadian government sent a plane to rescue its citizens and permanent residents, including Zhang's family. I was happier than winning a lottery. We were, you know, just completely relieved um, that we're finally on home soil. But one year later, that pandemic script has flipped. The first city in the world to be devastated by the new coronavirus now offers a glimpse into a post-pandemic future. Wuhan is roaring back to life back to school and work. Its residents can breathe easy, knowing there hasn't been a confirmed case of COVID-19 in this city since last spring. My mom is going out playing mahjong with her friends. My dad is doing business as usual. Um, so it's kind of, I'm kind of jealous of what they're doing uh, back there. With Alberta's COVID-19 caseload climbing to record highs, Zhang even considered taking his family back to Wuhan. We did contemplate on, you know, maybe flying back that way. 
because um, you know it would be safer for our kids, safer for us. But on the other hand, you know, Calgary is where our home is. The Chinese Communist Party, meanwhile, is declaring victory, unveiling a new sprawling exhibition in Wuhan. Hastily built on the site of a former field hospital, it recounts and celebrates the government's purported triumph over the virus, featuring photos of Chinese President Xi Jinping alongside medical workers, even a hospital hologram. I live five hours away on a train, but I came especially for this exhibition, she told Global News. I'm really touched. I feel that our country is really awesome. But this impressive display is also remarkable for what's missing. No mention of the whistleblowers, of how doctors like Li Wenliang, who died of COVID-19, first sounded the alarm against official orders, warning the virus was spreading between people. Or the citizen journalists like Zhang Zhen, sentenced to four years in prison for challenging the government's version of events by posting videos like this one taken inside a hospital. Chinese state media is also promoting a different COVID-19 origin story, claiming the virus actually originated in Europe and arrived in Wuhan on a shipment of frozen seafood. The seafood hypothesis does not make sense to me, and I suspect that's probably more politically motivated. Virologist Angela Rasmussen says the closest relatives to COVID-19 are found in bats in China, and there have been no related viruses found in any European seafood. It can take uh, multiple decades sometimes to identify the zoonotic origin of any emerging virus. A team of investigators with the World Health Organization has just been granted access to China, visiting the infamous Wuhan market linked to the first known outbreak. But residents here are less concerned with where the virus started and more about who's spreading it now. The COVID cases are mainly from imported food and people who come from abroad, this Beijing resident says, parroting the Communist Party line. Our government does a good job, this woman says. But in the West, people prioritize their own opinions ahead of the collective good. I think that's why it's out of control in the West. Indeed, China's economic recovery stands in sharp contrast to the COVID chaos elsewhere in the world. While Canada and others struggle, China was the only major economy that actually grew last year. The country where the pandemic appears to have started is now profiting from it, thanks in part to the sudden, unprecedented demand for PPE. Even before the pandemic, China supplied most of the world's personal protective equipment. But last year, those exports skyrocketed. Around 95% of Canada's imported face masks came from China, costing around one and a half billion dollars, even while some Canadian manufacturers sat on the sidelines. When the pandemic's first wave crashed into Canada back in the spring, this BC-based manufacturer pivoted to produce mass quantities of PPE. The government was reaching out to companies like ours. We were getting contacts from all sorts of different people uh, requesting different, having different types of PPE requests. But the president of Layfield Group, Mark Rose, says after six months, their masks remain in the warehouse, caught in red tape. The U.S. government agency that certifies medical grade N95 masks is dealing with a backlog. And without that certification, Rose says they've struggled to sell to local health authorities. Our products are collecting dust on the shelves. We just can't get these to market. And, and the government seems to be buying materials from other markets. Other markets like China. But those pandemic purchases have resulted in a laundry list of recalls involving millions of Chinese-made masks, including some that Health Canada inspectors found posed a health and safety risk to their users. There are all kinds of uh, quality problems with those products. Gordon Jung is the head of Maple Leaf Laboratories in BC, partnering with Layfield Group to produce PPE. We cannot compete with uh, overseas cheap labors. The government needs to support uh, domestic manufacturers. We've learned that we need to be much more careful in our collaborations with China. Those words are especially cutting coming from Margaret McQuaig Johnston 
For more than 40 years, holding senior posts with the Ontario and federal governments, she was a champion of China and helped to lay the groundwork for Canada's COVID-19 vaccine collaboration. That ended with the Chinese suddenly abandoning the clinical trials and partnership last year and withholding the vaccines. It's really been uh, tragic personally to see how China has changed under Xi Jinping. China is no longer the country that we once fell in love with. But China's success is difficult to deny. China reported just 2,000 domestic cases of COVID-19 in January. That's fewer new infections in a month than Ontario saw in an average day. Experts note its residents were already used to wearing masks after the SARS epidemic. And the elderly here tend to live with their families, not in care homes. But above all, Chong believes that Wuhan's lockdown worked. Residents had to follow its orders, of course. But Chong says they also wanted to. They never had any anti-mask protests. Um, everybody buys into the idea of social distancing, masking, and so they were able to eliminate the, the virus in a very uh, short period of time. Um, but here, um, I, I'm just not too sure that uh, we can get to that level of engagement. Although we should, and we should definitely try. I think just the way they did it is pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Coming up on the new reality. This exhibition is called Pandemic Pastimes. Early on in the pandemic, the federal government recognized the value of the country's small museums and put together an emergency support fund. It could have been a, a time to kind of sulk and, and cry and whine, but it turned into, let's empower our museum and then in turn empower our community. If we're not connected to our past, there is a danger we'll forget it. And across this country, the places that collect historical and cultural artifacts are suffering. Hundreds of small museums are struggling financially because of the pandemic and have closed. The challenge they face is not just trying to connect with the community, but to record and preserve what will go down in history as one of the most significant moments in a generation. Tonight, David Aiken takes us inside some of these cultural touch points. Africville, a village on the south shore of the Bedford Basin in Halifax, first settled in the early 1800s, residents in this close-knit community faced racism, neglect, and were denied basic municipal services. By the late 1960s, its 400 residents, black Nova Scotians, were forcibly removed. Their homes were razed. Their 150-year-old church destroyed in the middle of the night. The city council of the day called it urban renewal and wanted Africville's land for commercial development, room enough to build the bridge. It would take 40 years until 2010 when the city formally apologized and provided some of the funding to build the Africville Museum, created as a replica of the Seaview United Baptist Church that had been destroyed decades earlier. Juanita Peters is the museum's executive director. It was a cultural hub for the African Nova Scotian community, especially people of Africville. But today, as a museum, it's, it serves to uh, welcome people into this space and, and see why this space was so important to people of Africville. But this museum, like so many others across the country, has not been able to welcome anyone into this space since the pandemic forced museums to close their doors to visitors last March. When the pandemic hit, uh, you know, our, our revenues are really based off of people coming through these doors um, and buying product at the door, uh, having conversations, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was just devastating. Possibly worse, how does a museum fulfill its mandate with no visitors? The answer in Africville, a cookbook. And what is the thing that often brings us together? Food. Uh, it was such a great challenge. An Africville cookbook would step in as the replacement for the popular annual Africville Reunion, normally held every July in the park next to the museum. 
they're on the land, they're together, they're sharing stories, they're cooking, they're eating. And of course, because of the pandemic, they could not come this year. The museum tracked down former Africville residents, mostly women, many who had never written down any of the recipes, and compiled a history of the breakfast that fueled the day's labor, lunches on the fly, and dinners that workers would come home to at night. You know, these fish cakes are good for breakfast, lunch, or suppers. And it turns out, the cookbook reached beyond the museum's walls to be a tangible way to connect the community that the institution serves. Food is a universal language, so it actually ties people from all over the country and beyond. Early on in the pandemic, the federal government recognized the value of the country's small museums and put together an emergency support fund. More than 1,200 institutions tapped into that fund, which dispersed more than $33 million. Africville Museum received about $31,000 money that helped replace revenue from lost ticket and gift shop sales. But it's not just money that helps museums meet their mandate, it's also volunteers. Consider this, the last federal headcount of who does the work in museums or art galleries found more than 7,300 full-time employees, more than 11,000 part-timers, and a whopping 69,949 volunteers who provided a combined 4.3 million hours of free labor to the country's museums, helping hands that all but disappeared with the pandemic. And so, in a museum like the one in Swift Current, Saskatchewan, it was up to the paid staff, just four of them, to carry on. And carry on they did. First order of business, mask everyone up, even the stuffed bison that's been there since 1949. A teenager named Ranger, and Ranger, because of the pandemic, is of course wearing his mask. Lloyd Begley, the curator at Swift Current's museum, even tried to get a mask on the other must-see exhibit in his collection, a 37-foot Moses sore discovered in southwest Saskatchewan in 1993. And I tried to use a pillowcase, and it just it wouldn't fit. His mouth was too big. The pandemic has made the museum a relatively lonely place for Ranger and the dinosaur. So now we have to figure out ways to, to get our message uh, out to the, uh, to the community by doing programming. Solution? Mount an exhibition with the public's help to document how those in southwest Saskatchewan lived through the first lockdown. This exhibition is called Pandemic Pastimes. Photographs and stories about what life was like during the 2020 pandemic. Uh, the closing of the skate park the closing of the playgrounds. Stephanie Kadak is the museum's education and public programs coordinator, and she says all these artifacts will be archived by the museum for future researchers. So 100 years from now, um, people are going to be able to actually do an exhibition and have local information. This was a museum, having been given a lemon, figured out how to make lemonade. Ottawa gave it about $56,000 to carry on. Having gone through this experience, it's opened our minds to sort of different methods of communication rather than traditional interpretation of historical method or telling a story. In West Kelowna, after years of planning, the West Bank First Nation had just relocated its museum to brand new digs in this mall in February and was preparing for a busy spring. Then the pandemic hit. Museum assistant Coralie Miller said the news was tough to take. And when we had to cancel all of that, it was very disheartening, but we knew that we weren't going to be out of work because there's always work that needs to be done within a museum. Jordan Coble, a counselor for West Bank First Nation, has been one of the driving forces behind the museum. It could have been a, a time to kind of sulk and, and cry and whine, but it turned into Let's empower our museum, let's empower the staff, and then in turn empower our community to say, we got this. The museum preserves and celebrates the history and culture of the West Bank First Nation and the Silk or Okanagan peoples. So if visitors could not travel, the museum would via video on the web. Okay, let's go. It started off with just using a phone, 
um, and the, the phone microphone. So it was, wasn't the best quality in the beginning, but baby steps. Again, the Fed stepped in with $28,000 in emergency funding assistance. Among other things, the museum upgraded their video equipment. Now Kate will put the camera on a tripod, stick it on a rolly chair and chase me around the museum. So it's like, we're back in business, baby, just digitally. Coralie's videos were the shiny light in such a dark period for our community, for our nation, for the world. Uh, when the pandemic struck, there was such fear, anxiety, concern. There's too much doom and gloom on the news already. At least with this, we can get people to forget about their problems, at least just for a little bit. The videos are now core to the museum's mandate. It's important for our children to understand who they are, their family members, their relationships to the community, their relationships to the land that surrounds us, uh, but more importantly, the responsibilities and in that sense, be it West Kelowna, Swift Current, Halifax, or in many other places in the country, Canada's museums and galleries, despite all the obstacles of a pandemic, are meeting the challenge of what will surely be the most significant historical event of their generation. It can get pretty lonesome and it can feel a little debilitating when um, the work becomes, uh, feels like it's three times harder to get the same results. But when you're doing it uh, with others who are um, either more experienced uh, and uh, it, just, it just makes the work that much more fun. Next week on The New Reality. There's not enough governing bodies, infrastructures, places to celebrate black excellence. Think about all we have lost. Think about the stories that haven't been told. Think about the people with the talent that we haven't seen. Why did you and your brother feel the need to start the Black Academy? We didn't want to, uh, you know, continuously be lost in this perpetual loop of, you know, Canada not uh, uh, recognizing and supporting, you know, their black talent. That is the new reality for this week. I'm Donna Friesen. Thanks for watching.